Podcasting from the bowels of the Citadel, it's the DigiGuys. Digi and now, please welcome two men who definitely are at war, boys, Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. <laughs> There we go. Uh, Corey, who was that? That was sent in by Kevin Lower, who lives just off Fury Road on Anger Avenue. Ah, uh, that's a cute little quippy pun or something. Uh, Mark, welcome back again. Welcome back again. Thank you. Again, yeah. Tim, did, Tim had a good time filling in last time. Tim is always yes. the man. He is. By the Absolutely. way, I'm looking to see who gave a Ben Hur a positive review. Are you in a mood to explain to people why you uh, had a sudden absence? <laughs> Uh, I, I had a, a a lady friend. Oh, and this lady friend um, is a very special lady friend. There we go. And uh, she's special for a, 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 a very exciting reason. She lives five thousand miles away <laughs> in freaking France, and she teleported in. Ugh, it's the worst. Yeah. Now we have a we have a, a friend of ours who's a yeah. working screenwriter. Yes, what he does for a living, mm -hmm. and he's in a long distance relationship. He, he is, yeah. He's he's working the Italian angle. He, uh, yes, he's working the Italian angle, and yeah. I, I have to I have to uh, uh, I have to Consult commiserate with, with him, him yeah. because I am now working the French angle. Yeah, and so um, we had a great. We went to uh, where did we go? We went to the I took it to, to the Hollywood Bowl. Oh, nice. We saw uh, Jeff Beck and Buddy Guy. <laughs> what? No, I. It, she was it, into it. No, she I'm was into sure. It. Well, obviously, I know that. It's just, it's just if when you say to me, when you say to somebody, I went to the Hollywood Bowl, and and you start thinking, I wonder who'd you see, and when you say Jeff Beck and Buddy Guy, that is the most Hollywood. That is like a, that is a marquee Hollywood Bowl performance right there. That's well, why I he, expected the Hollywood Bowl. No, no. Here's the thing. She, she was only in town for a yeah. week. Yeah. So I wanted to take her to sure. some place she's never been, which would be the Hollywood Bowl. Sure. So I'm looking at, you know, a mostly Mozart and yeah. a Brahms concerto, who gives yeah. a crap, all that sort of whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. And then I see Jeff Beck and Buddy mm -hmm. Guy. Yeah. And I'm like, let's let's gauge her coolness. Excellent. Does she know who Jeff Beck and Buddy Guy even are, let alone wants to see them? Sure. So I gave her the choice. Would you like to see mostly crap art? Or Brahms' yeah. concerto number, who gives a crap? We're going to talk about some classical today, by the way. So, you're you're yeah. talking about. I'm yeah, okay. talking about Jeff Beck and Buddy Guy. <laughs> so I give her the choice, and you know what? She was all about the Jeff Beck and Buddy no, Guy. Of course, there you she's go. cool. So uh, on the industry front, lots of things have happened. Uh, first of all, Ben Hur tanking. As as everyone with a brain knew that it would, except for the people who spent a hundred million dollars on it, you know which what? is I, a I, mystery to me. I, I I want the person who greenlit Ben Hur and the person who greenlit Tarzan yes. to get in a room together and, and kill each other. Kill each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but honestly, truly, but when they announced Ben Hur remake, you know, I thought, okay, maybe. Uh, and then I heard, you know, what's his face wrote the script. It was a, it was like a spec script by the guy that wrote the Long Way, the last Peter Weir film, which was terrific. Uh, even though it made no money. And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm a little bit on it. And then they're like, and we've got Timur Bekmambatov directing. I was like, that's it. Done. Finished. It's over. It's a piece of junk. Why would you do that? Why would you hire him to direct? It just makes no sense. The because guy, the guy who did Abraham Lincoln, uh, Vampire Hunter. Yeah, that's our that's our Ben Hur director. Come on. There's this is here's what they want. They want it to be a faith. They want to pretend it's a faith based yeah. movie when really it's a CGI movie. Yeah, they're thinking chariot race CGI. We want the guy who did the uh, the Russian vamp wanted. We want chariot race yes. done wanted style. And the, and, no. and and we'll throw a little Jesus in there so that the faith based yeah, people might go see it. By the way, that 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 tower. Of uh, Blu-rays is yeah. about to fall down. Yeah, I know. I'm going to shake the uh, table till it <laughs> And so, so in other news, uh, Ryan Kavanaugh and uh, Brett and Brett Ratner getting into a, a, a Twitter war, which you know, I think is hysterical. You know what's funny is that it's it, so I, funny. I, for, and you'll never hear me. <laughs> You're like Ryan Kavanaugh. Did you read the reason? Yeah. Like, we're like, it's not that 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 Ratner did anything to Kavanaugh. It's just that Kavanaugh, people kept telling him Brett Ratner stories. Like, you know, Brett Rat I heard Brett Ratner did this, and I heard he did this. And at a certain point, someone finally told him another Brett Ratner story that was apparently so vile and so disgusting, he couldn't handle it anymore. And he whips out the phone and just to get, rips out a tweet storm, just tearing up on, on Brett Ratner because it's just he's too disgusted. He can't control it anymore. This is where we've come. We're multi-million dollar moguls. 
develop like moral anxiety about some cohort in the industry and the only way that they can unleash it it's not the couch trip anymore you just t- flame away on twitter at the person the, you know the, the the sad part is that brett ratner's career has taken a bit of a positive turn yeah well look, rat, rat pack is terrific it's fan- look if he just stops directing and continues to be a financing mogul i am totally cool with that because rat pack is financing some amazing movies yeah I mean, if it weren't for Rat Pack, we wouldn't have an awful lot. Of, I mean, between Rat Pack and Megan Ellison, that's kind of the only thing keeping good movies afloat. That is true. Frankly. Um, and then also uh, the anonymous letter to, to uh, Kevin Sujihara. Yeah, but no one really knows if that was... That's pretty intense, though. It's making oh, it's the rounds. it's intense, but we don't know whether it's an actual thing. Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> no, you, you want it to be as well. And then, of course, uh, Suicide Squad related to that Suicide Squad tanking. Uh, which it's not, I see. I, I here's the thing: as much as I would love to see it tank, I'm not really. Uh, I'm, I'm not convinced it's tanking. Well, it's made uh, 500 million around the globe so far. Yes, it's well. So he, it's, well, here's the thing: I, I, as of this recording, um, it's uh, it's got a cumulative of 248 million dollars. Yeah. Now, it's still a couple of days before this podcast gets posted. But, uh, you know, it's hard to say it's tanking, uh, as much as I would love to see it tank. Yeah. By the way, can I uh, throw out some uh, a, a Blu-ray news? Go ahead. Hit, hit us. I got some uh, listener mail, and then uh, we'll, we'll dive into it. Oh, there's else. ice cream, too. Oh, yeah. Good. Wait, it's, it's a very special day. See, Tim doesn't cook for me. No. He doesn't bake for me. He does not. He doesn't freeze for me, or whatever it's called when you do ice well, cream. Well, this is a very special day. Why? I'm going to give you the rare flavor of ice cream. Uh, that did not turn out well. No, that's nice. It is a maple syrup and walnut ice cream. So garbage disposal weighed. Garbage disposal weighed. Mm, one weighed. and the same. Yeah. Uh, we got some Blu-ray news. Yes. Should we, do, should we do Blu-ray news now, viewer mail now, or talk about Blu-rays now? What should we do well, now? We could do viewer mail, but we don't really ever get viewer mail. We get listener mail. I know. I wish we would get some Vox, Vox boxes. Why not? Yeah, Vox boxes. Hey. Gods? No. Gods at digigods.com. Gods at digigods.com for the listener mail, the viewer mail, the, you know, a Vox boxes, whatever you want. You could even send us, uh, you know, dirty pictures. All right, or so listener mean mail. Insults. I don't care. Blu ray reviews or uh, Blu ray bl- news. Blu ray, do the, the news thing. Hit that. Well, I'm very excited. Yeah. Uh, Marx Brothers finally starting to hit the Blu ray. Oh, so it's about time. Marx Brothers Silver Screen Blu ray collection, already on pre order, personally. About time. about time. October 18th. Now, I know what you're saying. Booyah. What are the films? Yeah. Are they all of their classics? Well, the answer, the, of course, is no. No. <laughs> we have The Coconuts. Uh, uh, which is their debut? Yeah, it's I okay. mean, it has Margaret Dumont, and she's. Got, it's okay. It's a uh, you know, it's 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 testing the waters. Oh my! Is that my phone? That's the bat phone. That's not my phone. No. Don't stop the recording. No, I'm not. I'm not. Animal Crackers, Monkey mm-hmm. Business, Horse Feathers, and of course, uh, Duck Soup. Now, if you're a Marx Brothers fanatic, no night at the opera. No night at the opera. Ah. Nobody's nobody's being pushed into a, 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 a thing on the boat where everybody yeah. throws in the, the, yeah. the boat. Night okay. at the opera. Truly, the biggest laugh I've ever gotten in a, in a Marx Brothers movie. I laughed just thinking about it. Is when they is at the opera house near the end when when Harpo grabs that guy's violin or viola and uses it like a baseball bat. It's the funniest thing. Now. Ever. Um, the, uh, there's not a lot of extras on these things, but the, there are a couple of audio commentaries by people we know. Yeah. Horse Feathers has yep. a commentary by FX Feeney. Very Bravo. excited about that. Yep. Sweet. Love FX. And then Duck Soup has a commentary by one of the only uh, film critics who gave Ben Hur a positive review, nice. Leonard Malton. <laughs> Leonard Malton gave it. Anyway, so I'm very excited about that. I'm a That's huge great. Marx Brothers fan. We also have Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, 15th Anniversary, 4K Blu-ray edition. Yeah, does it hold up? I I have not seen it in a long time. I bet it does. Uh, Criterion November titles. Here they are. Wade, you ready? Ready. Now, um, this is the one you're excited about. Mm-hmm. Lone Wolf and Cub. Yeah, totally. Aren't the you the a big complete lone the complete Lone Wolf and Cub. Yeah. Absolutely. Unbelievable. Yep. Uh, Punch Drug Love. Yep. Which I saw at Cannes, which yep. is in 2002, which is great. Yep. Adam Sandler, the the only performance he's ever, technically ever given. Yep. Uh, Kira Kurosawa's Dreams. Good stuff. Yep. Squid and the Whale, by the way, great yeah, film. Not, Squid and the Whale, no, no, fan. no. Not a, a fan. A, a, as a child of divorce of that era, now I was not living in Park Slope, although I would have, have loved to have lived in Park Slope. It's a beautiful area. Uh, as a child of divorce of that era, I am telling you, Squid and the Whale, almost autobiographical. It's a great film. Yep. And One Eye Jacks. One Eye Jacks, by the way, original director of One Eye Jacks. Wait, who was it? Uh, uh, Rafelson. Stanley Kubrick. Uh, Bob Rafelson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, anyway, one eyed Jacks with Marlon Brando. That's good stuff. Yep. Uh, so there you go. Yeah. That's uh, that is Criterion for November. I don't like that they announce them too far in advance because then I get all excited and I got to wait five months. Yeah, I know. that's how it is. So wait, here's the here's what we should do. Okay, I'm gonna read. Shall I read some stuff now? I, I, well, we haven't talked about any Blu-rays yet. I know. Would you like um, Would you like ice cream? Would you like bad ice cream now or bad ice cream later? Now. Okay. Well, let me let me hit a couple of these uh, things. First of all, we got uh, email from our good friend Al in San Francisco uh, because I had been I had praised a film some weeks ago for uh, a certain quality of magical realism. He said I thought Wade and magical realism are like oil and water. Uh, and I explained to him usually, but there are some stylistic exceptions, namely because it's not the device per se that I have a problem with as much as it is the, the, when they use it as like a narrative shortcut and, you know, just, Hey, look, magical things happen. If you aren't sort of using the magical realism invocation as an excuse to just bypass having to explain something, I can usually get around it. You want to know who's, you want to know who has used magical realism the best? Yes. You ready? Yeah. Woody Allen. I was just going to say that, <laughs> right? Purple Rose of Cairo, totally. And Midnight in Paris, and not even not even just Midnight in Paris, but uh, Purple Rose of Cairo. But, but no, no, not even just those. Midnight two. in Paris. Not what are just, you? You are dinging and ringing it's, and buzzing. What are it's, you doing? It's our friend Nadim, and Nadim's trying to get a hold of me, and uh, you know. Oh wait, is Nadim the guy who who invented the pizza box that folds into Correct. a little tiny square? That's it. That's oh the god, damn you, you guys, you don't even know. I know. He invented a pizza box. Like an actual pizza box. Ecofold. Like a, Ecofold.com. You'll find it, out all it about is, it. Go to it Ecofold. is just as strong. It was really, is that what it is? Yeah. No, it is not. Ecofold.com. Oh, I'm, to, I'm, I'm there right now. Go to Ecofold.com. I'm not kidding. Yeah. This thing, I have seen this thing in action. This is a pizza box that is just as strong as any other pizza box you'll ever see in your life, and it folds into a square about the size of a DVD. Yep. It's fantastic. Wait, I'm on EcoFold. There's, there's nothing there. ECO? ECO hyphen fold. Ah, yeah. Anyway, and then uh, we also got uh, a, a rather lengthy email uh, from Frank, Frank L., and uh, it went into some very interesting things. He, he, I, I won't get into all of the, uh, the stuff he asked, but he was, he was asking generally uh, mostly about Suicide Squad. And, there is uh, nothing on the pizza box. There's nothing about the pizza box on this website. Okay. I'll Ecofold.com. To, Ecofold. I mean, it says, we think about, design, and create simple solutions that help the world recycle without effort. Okay. I guess is as that? part of that is the – this is no, I'm, yeah. trying, I'm showing it to wait right now. This is yeah. all – this that, that's the whole site. Uh, but he has a pizza box that folds yeah. into okay. – it, it is it's, – it's, 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 the thing's freaking magic. It's, it, it's, it, it's it, genius. I, it, it kills me every day of my life that – that Domino's or will pizza, not will not buy into pizza it. Jack or one of these big chains. They have no, look. If they paid him, if they paid him a penny <laughs> per a, box, a, per box, I know he'd be a quadrillionaire. I know it would change the industry. I know it would. And 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 whoever does it would be seen as being on the forefront of green of green yeah, uh, I initiatives. And all. Yeah, I, I know. It just kills me. Absolutely it kills, kills it, me. It, it. Believe me. You it, know it, why? Because they don't want to pay him. They want to try to figure out a proprietary yeah. way to do it themselves. Yeah, they're idiots. So uh, why are we talking about well, – yeah, well, you know, fair enough. Boy, you, you, you wanted ice cream. Yeah. So anyway, um, uh, Frank Al, before we get into the reviewing stuff, he did – he asked specifically uh, about why people say that Suicide Squad, which had a negative cost of 175-some million, needs to allegedly make $800 million to break even. And I, I – that's always a good question. I'm always glad when people ask that question. So I, I – it's worth pointing out for those who may be listening. I want to emphasize this. This is why. This is how the economics of, of studio movies work. If a movie costs $100 million, assume that they're going to spend at least $100 million marketing. So your negative cost is $200 million plus because most of that is borrowed. They don't actually have that cash sitting around. They borrow it. From, they, get a, they get a credit line. They borrow it from the bank. So there's interest accruing for at least a year, year and a half during which the time they're spending this money. So it's $200 million plus some kind of interest, which will usually come out to be like $210, $215 million. Um, the money you make at the box office, you only get half of it. The other half generally goes to theaters. Depending on the split, the splits are different. No one ever knows what the split actually is. And it kind of shifts. It's a, it's a floating split. Like on the first weekend, the studio will get 80%. Second weekend, they'll get you know 75 and it eventually goes down to where nobody's going to see the movie, but the, stu- but the theaters actually collect 80% of the box office of like two people buying a ticket. So on balance, globally, you can assume that studios take roughly half, maybe a little more than half, but roughly half. That's a good estimate. So uh, if your negative cost is now $200 million plus 
and uh, a movie makes, say, $800 million, you get $400 million back. Out of that $400 million, there are a lot of profit participants, a lot of people taking pieces, um, you know, the gross participants who get, you know, 10, 15, 20 percent of, uh, of the original of the gross take. Eventually, after all the, uh, the points have been taken out and the, the pension, health and welfare and all the rest of it goes, you are left with money that is going to pay back your $200 million some negative cost, which by then is about two hundred twenty-five. And that's why a movie that costs a hundred and some million dollars needs to make about eight hundred and some million in order to break even. It's an ugly business, but that's the way it works. No, wait, no, you you got into profit participation. All, first all of that. Stuff. Yes, I got into all that stuff. Okay. All right, uh, I'm, I'm letting you know. Mm-hmm. This is a rare ice cream fail. Mm-hmm. It is a maple syrup and walnut ice cream. Good. We, but by the way, it's, it's not for, totally frozen yet. I just made it. It's a little bit soupy. Mm-hmm. But you're here now, so I'm giving it to you. Yeah, now. it's good. Really? Yeah. You would tell me if it was bad. Would you tell me if it was bad? It's a little icy. Yeah. It's a little icy. Not it's, creamy it's not enough. A, not creamy, right. Right. Yeah. Now, it might get, as it sits for overnight, it might get a little bit. Yeah, sure. The flavors might get a little bit more intense as it rests a little bit, but. Could I, could I, I, could I persuade you I would consider to do a, a key lime pie ice cream? I wouldn't mm. buy some off you. Let me see. Key lime okay. pie so. ice cream. You know what? I'm going to hit some uh, foreign language films first. How about is, that? Well, you're looking that up. There is key lime pie ice cream. I'm looking at, I know I'm looking it is. Right now. I know. It's good stuff. All right. I'm going to go through some uh, some foreign language films real quickly. Uh, Wondrous Boccaccio. That's Boccaccio with two pairs of two Cs. This is from Film Movement. Uh, the, uh, the Taviani brothers. If you know the Taviani brothers, they're kind of the original brother filmmaking team before there were Coens or the Duffers or whoever else. I mean, so many. Uh, I watched the second episode of um, Stranger Things. It's good. Sure. It was good. Uh, finish watching it. Everyone else has. Have, have you finished watching it? Oh, yeah. Are you kidding me? It's good. Oh, yeah. Ja. Kicks, kick cha. Kicks ja. booty. Yeah, it's fantastic. So the Tavianis make wonderful movies. Uh, they're getting older in the tooth now, but they still make really, really decent movies. It's a little slow. It's a little long. But, uh, you know, it, Wondrous Boccaccio has a lot of their, has a lot of their sort of um, trademark stuff. Now, this is based on the, uh, the Decameron by Boccaccio. Uh, so, you know, it is a literary adaptation with a lot of their, uh, their you know, unique, uh, unique, flares and flourishes but it's 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 just quintessentially them and if you understand their sort of delicate humanistic way of telling stories absolutely worth checking out uh that comes with a bonus short film called ground floor by uh, asia eisen of israel which is uh, very very sweet we also have uh zhang yang uh the great chinese filmmaker of the sixth generation paths of the soul a journey into humanity and faith uh, I've interviewed Zhang Yang, a uh, fascinating guy, really interesting. Uh, he's kind of fallen a little bit out of, uh, out of, out of the, uh, the scene of late. He made a wonderful movie years ago called Shower. People remember that, about, the, uh, about an old bath complex in, uh, in Beijing and you know, about modernity kind of consuming classic uh, Chinese culture and you know, the, 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 the rift between, civilization, between uh, generations. Fascinating guy, really interesting filmmaker. Um, anyway, this is a uh, this is about a group of Tibetans who make this kind of uh, this fascinating kind of um, pilgrimage uh, where they they basically journey over a thousand miles and they bow the whole way. It's a it's just a, a grueling ritual, but it is um, it's it becomes a really really. I mean, I hate to use all the cliche Buddhist words like Zen and existential, but it's exactly what it is. And uh, it, what you learn about each of the individuals making this and why they're doing it is really truly fascinating. It's a, really a great film, completely overlooked lately, and uh, definitely worth discovering. Uh, at Cannes uh, last year was The Other Side by uh, Italian filmmaker Roberto Minev- Minervini, a guy I'm otherwise not familiar with. This played in the Uncertain Regards section. The movie is The Other Side. This is also out from Film Movement. This is basically a, a very, very terrifying, ugly look at the uh, underbelly of fringe society in America. And uh, it, is, uh, it is worth looking at. Um, it, is a, it is a fascinating, fascinating, troubling, disturbing, and yet provocative film on many, many levels. Uh, we've also got uh, Cayetano Godardo's The Moving Creatures. 
which is a uh, this is part of the Brazilian film series Year One. Uh, and, uh, it is, you know, Brazil has not gotten a, a great rap of late during the Rio games. You know, they haven't exactly sort of, you know, I mean, it's been relatively event free apart from that. Uh, they robbed Ryan Lochte. I know. Isn't that amazing? Ryan Lochte got robbed. <laughs> That's such an embarrassment, uh, to, you know, Ryan Lochte. But in any case, uh, but, you know, Brazil has a film industry. People may not know that. By the way, you, you know, um, the Brazilian filmmaker film industry lost a giant this year. You realize that Hector Babenco passed. I know. Isn't that's sad. He's a Spider Woman. I know. So sad. I'm gonna take another bite here. It's melted mm. now. Not yet. Still good. Still loving it. Would you like more? I'm trying to give it away. Yeah, I'd love more. Really? Yeah. Why not? Anyway, uh, the moving creatures. Lovely uh, Brazilian film. Bad. Not bad. You're not even done with that. I know. When you're done I'm with gonna that, finish if it. you want more, I'll give you more. Okay, very good. Take some home if you want for all I care. Sure, why not? Anyway, uh, this is basically a, uh, a look at the experiences of three different women, three very, very different kinds of mothers, and uh, the experiences that their lives uh, inflict upon them. It's really a beautifully acted film. Uh, just a great showpiece for the actresses. Sweet Bean, wonderful movie. Uh, this is by Naomi Kawase. Mm-hmm. Who normally I don't particularly like as a, as a director, but this is actually a really sweet film uh, about a guy who runs a kind of a little kiosk where he sells bean curd. And this old lady comes and wants a job there, and her recipe, her ancient family recipe for bean curd is, you know, better than his. And it forges this amazing multi-generational relationship, and, you know, you learn about her life and his life. And it's just one of those really, really sweet Family dramas, intimate uh, human dramas that the Japanese don't often do, but which they do in this case. And so uh, Naomi Kawase really kind of hit a great one out of the park in that case. Uh, And then uh, the last two films, uh, Parched, which was the audience winner at the Indian Film Festival here in Los Angeles. This is by Lena Yadav, and this is from Wolf. And uh, this is basically about uh, four women and their experiences in uh, very, very different family situations. This was also at the Toronto Film Festival and a number of other festivals. Um, very moving, very powerful film. And then um, similar in some respects is the Pakistani film Duktar, which means daughter. This is by Afia Serena Nathaniel. And um, this, is a, this is, you know, is kind of what you would expect uh, in a remote region of Pakistan. Uh, looks at the experiences of women and several generations of women and the ordeals that they go through because of various traditional uh, situations that are inflicted upon them. Um, I won't give, you any, give any other details, but if that interests you, you will definitely, definitely love this movie. It is on Blu-ray. It is beautifully transferred. It was submitted as Pakistan's consideration, uh, their official Oscar submission for the uh, 87th Academy Awards. was not accepted, but it probably could have easily made the short list in a, in a lesser year. It really, it's a powerful film. And that is called Duktar, D-U-K-H-T-A-R. Yeah, no one cares, because I'm looking at uh, key lime pie recipes, key lime pie ice cream recipes, yep. and uh, there are a couple. Do it. Don't, don't, don't tell me about them. Just do it. I don't know which one I should do because... Yeah. Uh, if there's one that has little pieces of uh, graham cracker crust in it, that's the one you're doing. Actually, a lot of them require that mm-hmm. you crush some graham crackers. Oh, yeah. Do it. I don't know which one to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're eating ice cream. I'm looking at recipes for ice cream on okay. Google. We are not talking about Blu-rays. Mm-hmm. However, we can talk about Smoke on the Water. Smoke on the Water. Deep Purple, live at the NEC. I was never a huge Deep Purple fan, except for the um, except for the hits. Uh, Hush is actually I have to say that Hush is a great song, very dramatic stuff. Um, this is them in two thousand two, past their prime, but still young enough to rock and not be embarrassed by it. Um, I like that uh, the track listing for this uh, for this Blu Ray. Two of the tracks are keyboard solo and guitar solo. I don't see drum solo, though. There's always the drum solo. That's the solo. great thing about music in the 70s. You could do that. Exactly. Yeah. This is an eight-minute drum solo. Uh, anyway, so this is good stuff. Again, it's, uh, it's, it's um, recent enough where it looks good, uh, you know, 16 by 9, digital, 2002, but yet they're not so old that they're like, uh, you know, wheezy. Yeah. By the way, speaking of not so old, they're wheezy. When we saw, um, um, what's his name, Jeff Beck, uh, Steven Tyler showed up. Yeah. Sang, sang a song. Steven, right on. Steven Tyler, old. I know, right? Kiss. 
Kiss Rocks Vegas. Kiss, I don't know what to say about them anymore. I mean, I guess they're cool, but I just feel like they've been around for so long, and they haven't had a good song in 25 years. And, you know, they give a great live performance. They're back using the makeup. This particular um, Blu-ray and CD was shot in Vegas in 2014. A lot of great songs, Detroit Rock City and Rock, uh, rock and Roll All Night and all the ones that are War Machine, all the ones that you're used to hearing. So if you like uh, Kiss, go for it. But, I, you know, Gene, I, 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 I used to see Gene Simmons in the Gelsons in Century City. Yeah. And uh, he just looks like he's just like a doddering old man with jet black hair. Yeah. And because he's Gene Simmons. But Paul Stanley still looks like he's about 25. I saw, you know, I saw Paul Stanley yeah. at the Gelsons in Sherman Oaks. Yeah. I guess they love Gelson's. Yeah. So um, anyway, who doesn't? Who doesn't love Gelson's? Who doesn't? Anyway, I, I, so I, I see John Goodman at Gelson's. Is he is he thin? He is. He's really he like his shirt. His, yeah, his clothes are hanging on him. You know, I have to say it's it's going to be a good year for him. A Ten Cloverfield Lane was terrific, mm-hmm. and he's got another couple of movies coming out. He does. I'm telling you, he's the man. Yeah. Uh, Kiss Rocks Vegas Nevada. Why not? Yeah, sure. Well, could you want more of that ice cream? Sure. I'm trying to get rid of it. Rock on. Right. As long as we're on the subject of Kiss and Vegas, sure. Kiss in Vegas. That just sounds like the greatest combination of all time. Uh, we got some um, classical music stuff from uh, Naxos. Uh, Rossini's La Gazzetta. Giacchino Rossini's La Gazzetta. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, crazy about a lot of opera, especially Rossini, but why not? Uh, it's perfectly fine. Uh, it, it held me for about an hour and a half, and uh, it's considerably longer than that, but that works. And then we also have uh, Handel's Saul. Uh, this is part of the Opus Arte line. This is with the uh, Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment and the Glyndeborn Chorus. Uh, pretty intense stuff. Uh, I'm not enormously familiar with the Glyndeborn Chorus, but uh, it's good. And you know, Handel is always great. So this is a this is worth uh, this is worth watching. It's really kind of a trip, kind of uh, strange and intense and weird. Um, and then uh, we also have Mozart's D. Oh boy, I'm really. This is also the Glendeborn Chorus and the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, I'm going to try to pronounce this. I'm half German. I'm going to screw it up. I know I am. Die Entführung aus dem Serai or Serail. I don't know what it means, but anyway, this is Mozart. Mozart's always great. Uh, the music's great. Forget about the plot. Don't really know what it's about. Don't care. It's just great music. Uh, Herbert von Karajan, uh, Maestro for the Screen. This is a uh, film by Georg Wubolt on Blu-ray. And uh, this is all about uh, Herbert von Karajan and the Berlin Philharmonic uh, rehearsing and performing Bach. And it is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, Von Karajan, very controversial figure, but in my opinion, the greatest conductor uh, of the modern age. Really extraordinary. Fascinating film. Gives you amazing insight into the operation of an orchestra and uh, and what it means to be a conductor. The great Daniel Barenboim, getting a little old in the tooth, but uh, still kicks it out, working with the Staatskapelle Berlin to do Mahler's Symphony No. 9, which is just epic. Wait, uh, no one gives a crap. You also, get the, you also get the Mahler project on here as a bonus. And, uh, it, you know, it, it's just, uh, it's great. I I'll, mean, I'll, I'm going to buy it now, Wade. You like, you, like, you like Mahler, you like Baron Boehm, you're going you're gonna to love it. No, we like superheroes and we like uh, Criterion. And then lastly, the wonderful Sir Andras Schiff, extraordinary pianist, uh, sits down for a, uh, a a trio of great performances: uh, Mozart, Schubert, and Ve- and Beethoven. Beethoven's Piano Concerto Number no. One in C Major is the real uh, the real killer here. <laughs> Your name is Major too. Absolutely, absolutely wonderful stuff. That is on Blu-ray as well. And now we're into TV. Uh, starting with a uh, box set, you know, we've talked about the Complete Wonder Years before, the, which came in the big locker. If you always thought that was too obnoxious and you said, I want the Complete Wonder Years, but I don't want a giant tin locker that I can't really put on the shelf, they, they, they heard your cries. And they've now released the, uh, the Wonder Years, the Complete Series, in a just regular, plain, old, unbelievable, boring boxed set, which will fit much more uh, easily on the, uh, on the shelf. This contains all of the individual season sets as they were uh, released uh, individually. Now they're just thrown together in a box set. And you can tell because seasons one, two, and three have the Star Vista logo on them, and seasons four, five, and six have the Time Life logo on them. So they didn't actually conform any of that uh, for the sake of uh, making it look a little more consistent on the shelf. But it's fine. It's all the same stuff. hasn't changed any. So The Wonder Years is out there in a more accessible box set. Still a lovely show. 
a little bit dated, but still a lovely show. See, this, this key line one I don't like because the because the guy says, mm -hmm. I searched everywhere for a recipe like this on the net. Lots of looking, but no success. So here's one I made up myself. Mm -hmm. I don't want one that some dude on all recipes made up himself. Well, that's what everything although, is on all recipes. Although this one's this one has a has has one package of lime flavored Jello mix. Yeah, all right. Tell that's us about of, Castle. It's kind of interesting. Um, Castle, this thing's coming in for a landing. Um, <laughs> Castle. I, I, By I the way, a lot of television this week because this is what happens in August, right? All the new network shows. Start up in September, so everybody releases the previous season on Blu on Blu-ray or on DVD to kind of ramp you up, to catch you up, to get the juices flowing. Well, so this week and next week is going to be all lots of big big time TV stuff. Well, not this because this th this is the final season. Yeah, exactly. Now, well, this, now th this thing got canceled in a very strange way. It was kind of a bubble show on ABC, and then they wound up very. It was a very public firing. They fired uh, Stanek Kadek, who was one of the stars of the show. Nathan Fillion, of course, is the other one. Nathan Fillion has a real cult following, thanks to uh, the, the whatever it's Firefly, whatever it's called. And uh, yeah, so um, uh, what's your name winds up getting fired, and they just decided just to kill the show. So eight seasons, Weird. and now it's over in a really strange way that was uh, precipitated by a firing of one of the stars of the show. And uh, yeah, now it's over. So if you really love the show, and I don't know why you would, you can check out the eighth and final season of Castle on uh, DVD. Gnarly. Not, and you know what? It's not that the show wasn't doing that well. It's just that, um, you know, this, uh, the, the firing caught everyone by surprise. And that's it. Yeah. Now it's over. Well, so I got to say, man, all the, um, all the different twists on Sherlock Holmes that everybody's going for, they just it keeps getting tougher and tougher. Uh, I thought Elementary had something that it was able to work with, and fourth season of Elementary, it I just don't, I, it's not really working anymore. Uh, Johnny Mil Johnny Lee Miller's, you know, modern hipster Sherlock Holmes, and then the whole angle with you know it Lucy Liu playing cool Watson. For, it seemed cool for like a minute and a half, and then you're like a minute eh, and a half. Like After four seasons of this, you're like, why am I watching this? What is the point of this anymore? Does this go anywhere? And then, as I'm thinking that, I read that they've announced now a comedy version of Sherlock Holmes with Will Ferrell and John C. Riley playing Holmes and, and Yo-Yo. I'm sorry, Holmes and Watson. Um, Sweet. What? Like, wh wh I mean, I'm not going to say never, but those two together are not always a home run. No. Like, that's, that's really a hit-and-miss pairing. Sometimes they're incredibly funny, and sometimes it's two guys – just improvising until they guilt, just guilt the audience into laughing at something that's not funny. It is cool. And I got to be honest, that that sounds like a great pitch that that uh, you know about 3 seconds after you come out of your pitch hangover, you think, "Oh my gosh, what have I done? What did I just greenlight?" Like land it'll be like land of the lost. Yeah, oh, exactly. Uh, yeah. And then it's not. No. Uh, anyway, NCIS. Yeah. Look, it's uh, season seven hundred fifty thousand of NCIS <laughs> for Tom Harmon. Uh, what's his name? Mark Harmon. Mark the, Harmon, the uh, most handsome man in the history of television. You know, he He's was married to Pam, Dar Pam Dauber. He was, he, 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 was a, he was a quarterback at UCLA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is 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 he pretty much? Uh, don't you think that at this point he is the most successful actor to also be a college superstar quarterback? Um, I mean, who else? Like O.J. Simpson know. at the time, but I, not anymore. Uh, like who? Was, I don't know. Who was like a like like a like a top name college star, and they just gave it all up and decided to be an actor. Uh, I mean, I, like Will Ferrell, Tom Cruise, Will I Smith. I don't know. They, no, I don't know. Mark Jim, Jim Brown. He's this guy started on thirteen seasons. Of this crap. okay? Fine, sure. Why not? Uh, all right. NCIS season thirteen. You don't no, no, seriously? Who are you people to buy this? Yeah. Anyway, there's audio commentary, some deleted scenes, and uh, otherwise, no one cares. I mean, who, 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 who are we kidding? Yeah, I know. So um, we got a little uh, DC edge here. DC's taken a lot of lumps lately, but you know, I gotta be honest, Gotham, it's not working for me. Second season of Gotham, I gotta be honest, not working. They've had, you know, this started off really interestingly, showing us, you know, the 975th uh, death of you know, Bruce Wayne's parents, which we're, we've all seen now so many times. The pearls in slow motion hitting the pavement half a dozen times, the Tim Burton way and the 
The, Even Batman Superman had it. But oh at least I got it over with in the opening credits. Oh, so my thank gosh. you for that. It's just been endless. And we got that in the first season of Gotham as well. And uh, the second season, you're like, okay, start paying some stuff off. I want to start, you know, I want to see this start becoming the kind. And they're not really, it's just not working, man. I don't, it's, it just feels like they're afraid to take that extra step and really start paying some stuff off. They just kind of want to keep the tease going, and it just it feels lame. So, uh, you know, I, I kind of want to see young Bruce Wayne evolve more. I, this thing's got to speed up a little bit. It's not really it's it's not paying off. It's not scratching the itch, as it were. Uh, you get a few extras, about you know a little close to ninety minutes worth of featurettes, which isn't fantastic. There's some stuff from Comic Con, and uh, you know. Uh, it, it's just the usual. It's a lot of it, but not nothing really very dense. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that's a Blu-ray that also comes with ultraviolet. Yeah, it's your ice cream. It's freezing my vocal cords. <laughs> my my ice, my two icy ice cream that you that you're the only one who likes. Yes, and then uh, also from DC, the complete first season of DC's Legends of Tomorrow, uh, which continues on the CW. This was a this got a little bit clunky in its first season. Uh, the but, you know, it's all part of the Greg Berlanti thing that's going on right now. And Berlanti, the stuff that Berlanti actually is is deeply involved with, from Arrow to Flash to Supergirl, Legends Tomorrow, I think all that stuff largely works. I, I think he's – I've said this before. Flush, just give that whole big screen thing, the whole Zack Snyder thing, give it an enema. Get rid of the, you know, Zack Snyder and his whole – chiseled, posing, shiny and wet look. Get rid of all that stuff and just bring Berlanti in and tell us some stories and let him have some fun with it. You know what? I, I think that they should hand it all to Ben Affleck. Yeah, you know. He's already directed an Oscar-winning Best, best Picture. Yeah, but the he's... I can direct. He has his, he, his sensibility seems to be more pretty grown up at this point, which yeah. is surprising to everybody. He's got a big screen sensibility. You know, he has the chops. He has the pedigree now. I think they should just give it to him. Forget the Zack Snyder guy's name. Well, anyway, if you don't if you don't know what Legends of Tomorrow is, it's a it, it's a basically a collection of of good guys and bad guys who have to take out a particular villain, and uh, it is it, it's it's a there's there's a lot of juggling of individuals here, and some of them are borrowed from you know like Wentworth Miller shows up from uh, playing Captain Cold from The Flash. Uh, as do, you know, along with Dominic Purcell, who was also uh, in those same episodes, and you know, there's some other stuff here. The other Victor Garber from from The Flash. They all kind of you know show up and they do a few interesting things. And you know, Hawk Girl shows up and Firestorm. And then, you know, I, I mean, it's a it's a it's a very clever sidestep from the other shows. It was a it it, it isn't it doesn't come out of the gate quite as effectively as the other shows did. But I think they, uh, I think they go into some interesting places, and I think it sets up a second season really nicely. And I'm looking forward to what they do with it. So that also is on Blu-ray with uh, Ultraviolet. You know, one of these recipes has half a cup of key lime juice. Mark, nobody cares. The other has. That's your line. That's when you talk about the, yeah. the, the classical meal. Mm-hmm. One has half a cup of key lime juice. The other has a third of a cup of key lime juice. Okay. I'd rather have the one that has half a cup, right? That's sure. Key lime juice. Anyway, a scandal. I'm I'm done watching the show. I don't care anymore. It was fantastic the first yeah. couple seasons. You know, you've really got to respect uh, uh, Shonda Rhimes. Just kind of taken over ABC. It's, it was like her. It's basically her network at this point, which yep. is amazing. Uh, good on her. But um, scandal. I feel like it's it's becoming too soap opera now, and it's it's lost a little bit of the juice. It's not new and fresh and surprising anymore. Uh, but people still like it. And this uh, fifth season d- uh, DVD has uh, extended episodes, which is always kind of nice, and bloopers. And uh, I like it. Because you know what? Anything that uh, employs Joe Morton, I like. Because Joe Morton's cool. He was in a Terminator little, too. Maybe a little too nutty, the ice cream. Nutty? Mm-hmm. That's, to me, that's all that's giving it any flavor. Yeah, well, well, you know how it is. <laughs> well, sometimes you feel like a nut. Yeah, and sometimes you don't. <laughs> if anybody, anyone on our show actually knows what that means, that uh, means you're, you got you got, you're, you're of a certain age. Uh, continuing the DC thing, Supergirl, complete first season. Um, I have to say, there, there were a few things about Supergirl that I, I was not completely on board with when it started. It seemed to iron out the wrinkles as it went along. Now, I'm totally down with the idea of a, of a black Jimmy Olsen. No problem there. Chris Rock was going to be Jimmy Olsen once. I thought that was cool. Um, the, what I'm not really down with is Jimmy Olsen 
being an incredibly hunky stud. That's kind of weird. It's a CW. Everybody in the CW is a hunky stud. Uh, yeah, but the thing is, the like, girls are hunky studs. If Jimmy Olsen is a hunky stud, then you suddenly set a really high bar for Superman. And the guy who's playing Superman now in this, in this next season that is lame. Was, yeah. It's like, okay, you are not cool. Jimmy Olsen, cooler than you. And that's a problem. When they, sh- when, when they released that shot of Superman in the costume, yeah. you thought, oh, my God. This yeah, is like the like, worst Superman ever. Yeah, it's the worst. <laughs> it's terrible. He looks terrible. I know. It's not good. But still, I like, I like the whole, again, I'm very much a defender of what Berlanti's been doing. And I think this season kind of gets itself together by the end. I love her. I think she is absolutely great. Um, yeah, I, she's, just, she's just terrific. Uh, you know, I, and I'm one of the people who liked the, uh, the Supergirl movie, the original movie with uh, Helen Slater. You're an idiot. Why? What's wrong with that? It was, it was with Faye Dunaway vamping it up. Uh, yeah, but it's, it was a lot of fun. Anyway, I, I really thoroughly enjoy this show uh, once it gets its act together at the end. This also comes with a bunch of extras that include the uh, Comic-Con panel and unaired scenes and gag reel and featurettes and all the usual stuff. Again, also Blu-ray and Ultraviolet, so you can really DC it up on Ultraviolet with all these shows. Maybe I'll try this one. Yeah, why not? I'll try this one. Uh, well, as long as you're still looking at recipe Superstore Season 1... <laughs> Uh, which continues this fall on uh, NBC. I really, I just, it, it, at a certain point, it feels like, okay, well, let's see, we've done, uh, now that we're doing the whole single camera sitcom thing, we've done, you know, in a hospital, and we've done it in a community center, and Parks and Rec, and let's see, what else can we do? I know, let's just have a bunch of people waxing wacky in a superstore, a Costco, Walmarty thing. Um, you know, like, the, it, it, it's like the office taken down a notch the uh, the people the office deliver their paper to that's what this is about it just it's more the same the same kind of characterizations i don't think it's funny i'm sorry sorry nbc sorry universal i really really don't think it's funny i think it's kind of a waste of uh of some very talented people anyway uh season one was truncated 11 episodes and uh, more of this is coming. A lot of people really like this show. They seem to enjoy it uh, in a way that I clearly cannot. So take my uh, criticisms with a grain of salt. Obviously, I'm not connecting with this kind of show. I'm noticing. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of not connecting with, with this kind of a show, Wade, yeah. The Walking Dead. Yeah. Can I say that I'm the only person who is not into The Walking Dead? Sure. And I'm all about the zombies. I want zombies. I know. I love my zombies. I do. I don't love my vampires. I'm not going to love the mummy with Tom Cruise. Did you see the Korean film uh, uh, Train to Busan? I did not. It's a zombie movie. Really? It's good. Yeah, it's, it's basically it's basically World War Z meets Snowpiercer. I like World War. Oh, I love Snowpiercer. It's zombies on a train. Really? That is exactly what it is. Is that is that theatrical or, or is that it was it, it's still playing in Koreatown? I had to review it for radio a few weeks ago. Is it, it's good. It is really good. It started off, and, and, I, and I was watching it, and it was really interesting. It's a father and a son, right? And the father's trying to get the son back to, on the train to you know, see his mom. And there's a, whole, there's a whole family thing going on that's really in it. Kind of, and I didn't know what it was about. And then next thing, I'm like, oh, no. Is that, did that person, did I see something in the back? Wait a minute. What's going on? Oh, no, it's zombies. And then, you know, it's people foaming at the mouth and biting, and it's, just, it's, it's all over. The, and I was ready to check out. And then it got really interesting. Yeah. The characters were good, and I was in with it. And, and uh, of course, you know, there's a whole political subtext, North Korea, South Korea. You know, you can read all that stuff into it. So, yeah, Train to Busan. Check it out. By the way, you hear who might be directing World War Z 2. Uh, yes, I did. Yes. David Fincher. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm down. Oh, I, I, first of all, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. No. But anyway. Can you imagine David Fincher directing, like, just this, this badass, balls-to-the-wall action film? Come on! I'm not sure it's a good marriage, but carry on. Uh, you know what? I have a feeling it's better on paper than it's going to be in, 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 in practice. Yeah, I agree. But um, I like World War Z. I thought it was cool. I did. I like World War Z. I love my zombies. Walking Dead, however, too much talking, none of zombies. I need more zombies. I don't care about uh, what Nicholas is doing and what uh, Rick is doing. I, I, just, I want zombies. Carol, I, I don't care. I really don't. Yeah. I want more zombies. But, um, you know, this thing just keeps going. And um, I like the fact that they employ uh, female directors on this show, which is um, something that more shows should do. I'm just putting that out there. Um, anyway, so this show, uh, people love the show. I The problem is is that, to me, zombies are things that like run around and bite people, and, and they get me all excited. But uh, there's like so much character on this show that um, I, I'm, I'm like the last person to say this, but uh, there's too much character, none of zombies. I need people being eaten. I need people eating other people. Yeah. So oh. there you go. You'll never hear any me say this again, but too much character and story, not enough zombies. 
A little bit of that same problem afflicts Narcos, uh, which a lot of people love. Narcos is an acclaimed show. Uh, it's got you know it's gotten Golden Globe nominations and the whole deal. Uh, this is season one of Narcos, which turns uh, Pablo Escobar, the Colombian drug uh, maven, kingpin, whatever maven you want to call him. Turns him into a TV character, which is a little weird. Uh, look, it's a very intense show. It's well researched. It uh, it's tough to know what you know where the, where fiction leaves off and facts begin and all and vice versa. Some great performances. Uh, Wagner Mora as as Escobar is terrific. Uh, the the DEA agents who who have to you know make it their mission to get rid of him. Boyd Holbrook and Pedro Pascal also very good. However. Um, it just does, it still feels a little bit forced to me. It still feels like uh, too much ripped from the headlines, and we're going to take a, a thin skeleton of real events and kind of put a veneer of drama on top of it. It just doesn't. It it kind of loses me at a certain point. But I'll give him credit for trying. We'll see where it goes in the second season. I don't know how you how you keep this thing going for more than you know three, maybe four seasons tops. I just don't. It just feels like like you should be wrapping this out after eight episodes, kind of like uh, Stranger Things. Anyway, uh, oh, that's your things, by the way. Narcos season one on Blu-ray with uh, Ultraviolet, like they all have. I'm getting through tr- uh, Stranger Things. That's good. It's great. It's terrific. Winona Ryder, loving She's it. Back. She's back. Speaking of things that are back, Roots. Now, uh, Roots. Uh, I have to say that uh, this is all uh, very tastefully done and very wonderful. But, but uh, was I it almost, needed? Uh, you know, here's the problem. The problem is. There's going to be a moment when you're like, okay, a a, 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 a slavery story won Best Picture. Yeah, right? and another one, and well, it, 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 aside from the whole, you know, Nate Parker now with the Birth of a Nation was going to be the film to beat this year, right? I mean, now he was it may not be, and now suddenly the that whole college rape thing has resurfaced, and he's dealing with it, I think, in a very mature way. Again, it was like 17 years ago, 15 years ago, whatever it and was. And he was acquitted. And he was acquitted. So, uh, you know, that, that is, but nonetheless, the court of public opinion can be cruel and can uh, certainly reach a different verdict from the court of law. And uh, so it remains to be seen what happens there. Nonetheless, there's also Underground, which is, you know, a, a successful show on television. And, the, you know, the, the slavery thing, we had Django, it's, it's getting to a point where I think white actors, black actors, all actors and all audiences – are getting a little fatigued to the idea that, like, now the rite of passage for every black actor in Hollywood and every black filmmaker is to make a slave movie. I think we we need to move past that. I really well, do. Well, it's funny because... So no, I, I, I'm not going to fault anything. Like, I think this is a very well-done remake of Roots, but is it necessary? I, I've kind of, I'm not sure. Well, it, will, it have the, will it have the impact that the original had? I mean, it, no, there's of no course way. Because the original was in... In a, in, it's like in, Ben Hur. The original was in a three network universe. Yeah, and we had never seen anything. We'd like never that. seen it before. It was a story that had not been told before. Yeah, now it's been absolutely. told uh, a million different ways. Million What's different funny ways. is that nobody has this issue with Holocaust movies. It's always yeah. a Holocaust film, but somehow with with the films about slavery, although obviously it's America's original sin and all that yeah. sort of stuff, there's something about it that that it's it's Oscar bait. It's there to score easy points by making me feel guilty because it is part of my DNA just because right. I'm an American. Um, but the Holocaust never gets that kind of a rap, Holocaust film, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, I'm not really sure why. Maybe because, again, cause, cause, because slavery is so uniquely, not uniquely, but let's just say yeah. American, whereas the Holocaust really is only because we joined the war did right. the Holocaust become yeah. an American did the Holocaust become an American problem because we joined the war. Right. Whereas slavery is yes. was our original sin. It's so a, there's it's, always something right. there that's going to play on my guilt. Yes. That I feel like is becoming a little too easy. I agree. You know. But yep. that being said, I mean Roots is it's terrifically well done. No, it's really well done. You know, it's very emotional and very engrossing and it's and uh, ultra, it's on Blu ray and ultraviolet like right. everything else this week. Great performances and uh it, it, it you know, it's it's really top notch uh top notch filmmaking, but uh I, I don't know that I wanted to see this now. So the show on Fox called Lucifer, which starts a new season soon, uh this is the first season is now on D V D, not on Blu ray. I don't really get it. I have you watched any of this? Huh, Lucifer? Yeah, oh. you watch this? Okay, well, so, it. well, it's like, th- basically, this is Wings of Desire, except with the, with the other guy. Oh, I love Wings of Desire. And, and done like it would be a CW show. So, Satan, a.k.a. Lucifer Morningstar, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, 
Is uh, his name Louis Cipher? No, it's not. Uh, so he uh, he comes to L.A. and hey, man, it is a it is a cool place. But then he starts in a, you know having experiences and relationships and friends, and then uh, begins to wonder, am I who am I? Am I really the Lord? It's not. It's not. It's weird. Uh, it's very forced, and it, it thinks it's deep, but it's really not very deep. It's just kind of uh, trying to be clever in ways that it has no business even dreaming of. But I, you know, it, maybe it'll maybe a second season will write this ship. But it just feels like a, it feels like an idea in search of a, a script somewhere, anywhere. It's really, really odd. Now, speaking of really odd, there's um, Ash versus the Evil Dead. Now, you know, I have to say that uh, uh, I don't know why this is a show, but uh, you know, uh, Sam Raimi. I, you know, he had a thing. He was Spider-Man. He was going to do all sorts of great movies. Know, then right? he sort of fell off the earth. Bruce Campbell, you can see that he, he'll do whatever the hell. This is, uh, this is a thing he did 30 years ago, and he's still cashing in on it. And I guess God love him. Yeah. But I don't know that the world needed an Evil Dead TV show, but this thing is pretty funny. Um, it's, uh, it's on Stars. I thought that um, the first season was funny, really disgusting, Kind of outrageous, and I got a kind of a kick out of it. I, I really did not think um, I would. And Lucy Lawless, who I have no particular love for, she's fine in it. I liked her. And, uh, yeah, so I have to say that Ash versus Evil Dead um, really surprised me. I got to say, it's good stuff. Well, there you and go. There's a, and it's, uh, the next season's coming up in uh, October. There's audio commentary on all the episodes. Um, some are better than others. Um, and a couple of featurettes that you'll just watch once and never watch again. But I have to say that um, I thought this thing was surprisingly um, kind of cool. Ash versus the Evil Dead. So, uh, Travel Detective, interesting show. Uh, Are we still talking about TV? Yeah, Is we got nothing else. N- it's heaps of television this week. We got to burn through it, man. Oh, well, we people, you know, we're people, not people. burning through it. We're, we're slowly know. waiting. Okay, through so it. Travel Detective season three with Peter Greenberg, a uh, documentary show from PBS. Which, uh, where Greenberg goes into, you know, uh, he, he go, travels around the world and he finds interesting little tidbits to tell you that'll make you uh, interested to go and visit those places. That's more than just, isn't this a lovely hotel and isn't this a pretty beach? He tells you fascinating stories about, you know, uh, ghosts on cruise ships and, uh, you know, w- things happening in parts of the world that might make them inhospitable to travel. So go there anyway just to show that you can take a dare and uh, places where the legal system might not be your best friend. And, uh, you know, it's, it's meant to kind of scare you in, into uh, going places, if that makes any sense. Uh, also, second season of uh, Halt and Catch Fire on AMC. Uh, another show I don't really get. Don't, don't quite get it at all. Uh, have you watched this? I have not. That's know, why I, you're talking about it, not me. Yeah, I, I know some people that uh, really, really love this, and they said, oh, you got to watch Halt and Catch Fire. And I watched it, and I, I, I watched, like, two episodes. I just don't get it. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's just too – it's too millennial, and it's too tech. And uh, I, it's, it's like uh, – what's, uh, what's the nerd show? Silicon the, Valley? No, the other nerd show. With Silicon the, Valley? No, the, the, the geek and nerd show. Silicon Valley? No, the, the, you know which one I'm talking I about. The, with, the M, with the MIT guys, the – Three oh, Big thing. Bang Theory? Yeah, that thing. Oh, it's like Big Bang Theory without jokes. Uh, I, I'd rather have my eyes gouged out than watch yeah. Big Bang Theory. It's like the Big Bang Theory yeah, is. B- bazunga. What? That, honestly, Bazunga? Bazinga? That's yeah, like the funniest thing that they came up with that's on a t-shirt. Bazinga. Yeah, Why yeah. is that funny? I don't know. It's not. Bazinga. God, anyway. so terrible. Anyway, it's, uh, it's, it, this, is, uh, this is all kind of you know techie and new and millennial. Uh, it's not really my thing. Uh, the Strain. Season two. You remember when this was a billboard and people made them take it down because it was know, too disgusting? It was all phallic and disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is season two of The Strain. And, uh, you know, in this season, uh, the virus has um, become an epidemic and uh, they're trying to stop it. Uh, Corey Stoll's in this. Corey Stoll, of course, from uh, the, the thing with the president guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Why not? <laughs> the thing with the president guy. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, 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 did, I did not watch the entire season, but I, I, I did watch uh, 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 much of this, skim through it, and yep. uh, I kind of liked it, actually. You know what? Sure. Some, of the, some, of the, some, of the, um, some of the characters and story strands are just sort of like stretching out the season. You know, like, yep. okay, yep. what's the guy, Zach? I don't mm-hmm. really care about Zach. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like The Walking Dead. I want to see just like monsters and I know people do. running around in hazmat suits yep. trying to like stop the end of the world. 
That's all I want. Are you enjoying see. all the stuff in Stranger Things, all the references to uh, Alien and to E.T. and Explorers and uh, Goonies and everything you know, else? I, I think that there's a website that like lists them all. Well, I, they, I guarantee you they didn't get them all. There are some mashups on YouTube that uh, that claim to get most of them, and I was pulling. I'm like, okay, you missed the Dead Zone. You missed Altered States. You missed Needful Things. There's a lot that they don't get, so I, I don't think they're going to get them all. I think there are at least 20 or 30 movies that are all uh, referenced in there. Anyway. All right, so uh, – um, oh, is it Yeah, carry on. All right, so the producers of NCIS, they uh, threw a dart at a map of the United States, and it landed on New Orleans. <laughs> and so they decided to do a show called NCIS New Orleans. Oh, uh, who knows why. Because it's cheap to shoot there. And it's, it's in the south, and maybe they thought that the numbers yeah. were a little low in the south. Hey, let's do a show in New Orleans. We'll shore yeah. up our numbers in the south. Yeah, it didn't work. This is with uh, the ageless Scott Bakula. And uh, this thing's a piece of crap. I, 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 I skimmed five episodes of that, and it just seemed ridiculous. Um, anyway, no one cares. Yeah, no, no but whatever. Code Black, uh, season one, Code Black. You know what? I didn't mind this show because um, I love Luis Guzman. Even if Luis Guzman is being serious, don't He's care. He's the best. I don't care. I know. I love, uh, I love Luis Guzman. He's great. Put that out there. Um, yeah, this is it's a medical drama. It's a, it's actually, it's, there, there was a documentary called Code Black, and it's kind of based on the documentary and it's all about all the chaos that goes on in this uh in this uh, hospital um and so there's at this point there's been so many of these sorts of shows that you can almost direct these things and write these things in your sleep because there's been so many that's come before it so it becomes a sense of visually i know what i'm going to see but can you and even story-wise i know what i'm going to see but if you can give me interesting characters give me something new on the character front maybe i'll stick around and this one doesn't really do that, but what gets me through is kind of the cast, because I think the cast is um, is totally worth uh, checking out. Because, again, you have Luis Guzman, and you have Marsha Gay Harden. Come on, Oscar winner, can't beat that. So, really, the cast is the only thing that gets you through, Code Black Season 1. The Affair, Season 2, from Showtime. Uh, this is a good show. It uh, it it. it transcends that kind of uh, – it wants to sort of jump into the same swamp as shows like Scandal, you know, ooh, murder, illicit affairs and uh, infidelity and sexy people and who's who's doing what with whom and who's responsible for what. And it kind of, you know, tries to be like a, like a seedier, more sultry Agatha Christie type thing. Um, but you know what? Twelve episodes. They really take their time. They build, uh, the, they build the characters. They build the narrative. They do a good job. And uh, it's very interesting. This is uh, season two. Continues to be very, very interesting. Great performances. I got to say, Dominic West, fantastic. Joshua Jackson's very, very good. Always love seeing Maura Tierney do good work. Uh, she gets better and better. So uh, this is a cool show. Keeps keeps doing cool. The Affair, season two. And speaking of cool shows, might also want to make mention that uh, The Rockford Files is out again, courtesy of Mill Creek. Oh, Seasons one and two I in love very. The Rockford Files. Oh, isn't it the best? You know what? I watched the. Uh, I watched the pilot with so much glee, and I had totally forgotten that, that the pilot of the Rockford Files. Do you remember the pilot? Did you ever see the pilot? I, I, I've got okay. the time. First of all, it, 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 you know, it, 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 a, a young woman hires Jim Rockford. Remember Jim Rockford was like in prison. You know who that young woman was who hires Jim Rockford in the pilot? Um, Lindsay Wagner, free bionic woman. God. You know who plays her really, really troubled brother, looking Lindsay, all scraggly, Lindsay all grown Wagner? up? Billy Mummy. <laughs> Come on. Billy Moomy. Billy Moomy, Mummy, whatever. Billy Moomy. <laughs> Lindsay Wagner, Billy Moomy. It's like a it's like a TV nerd, sci-fi nerd's dream come true that that show. That you're pilot like, has me hooked. You are like one eighth uh you are one eighth closer to an episode of Battle of the Network Stars. There you go. With Lindsay Wagner Isn't that and true? Billy Moomy. Awesome. So awesome. You know what's great about the tunnel? What's great about the tunnel? So the tunnel is uh it's actually not a bad show. It's it's kind of it's taken on a, a new meaning. It's about this British detective and this French detective, and uh, the issue is that there's a, a French politician is uh, is found uh, murdered right on the border there between like the between like the UK and France. Ah, so yeah. detectives from both sides team up to try to solve the murder. What's funny is that with Brexit, now ah, the yeah, British yeah, detective, his passport will not uh, work to get him into France. What's he gonna do? Uh, it's a good thing they did the show now. Right. Because now we'd have to get his passport out. Yeah. He had a whole bunch of uh, exposition. He can't yeah, find his yeah. passport. What's going to yeah. happen with Brexit? It's unbelievable. So um, anyway, so this thing is uh, the tunnel. I, I knew nothing of this thing. and it, 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 It's like a PBS thing. and it, it, it's, um, I was very surprised that it is uh, well-directed, and it's got a lot of cool cat-and-mouse stuff going on. 
and uh, I liked it. It's you know, it's got a lot of plot twists. Some of them are mm, less believable than others, but um, yeah, I thought it was pretty good. Total surprise. The tunnel complete for a season now on. Uh, the Ray That Is Blue. Oh, uh, yes. Are we course. doing movies anytime soon? Yeah. Vampire Diaries, the complete seventh season. So what happens is there's vampires, and they're all really hot because they're on the CW. And um, at, this is just the douchiest show in the world. <laughs> Who watches this crap? <laughs> Come on, people. What's wrong with you? I'm not going to argue with you. Not going to argue with you. All right, Mark, we got we, we, we got a couple of movies. Remember when the CW did Beauty and the Beast, and the other reason why he was a beast was he had like a scar on his thumb or something. He had like a scar on his thumb. He was the beast. <laughs> it's the worst. Uh, it's fantastic. So, Mark, uh, we got a few movies. Tell us why The Huntsman, Winter's War, prequel to uh, Snow White and the Huntsman, uh, needs to be on 4K Ultra HD. Please tell us why we must see this godforsaken horrible prequel this, uh, on 4K Ultra HD. This thing does not need to be on 1K. Okay, <laughs> there's not even there, 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 there's there's no K that is uh, uh, lame enough for this horrible movie. You know, this seemed like one of those films where I guess everybody got a nice paycheck and they were they were they were they thought the international numbers were good enough where people would go see it everywhere but the United States. You know, I just... It's got a good cast. Yeah. I mean, J- J- my, 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 my future ex-wife, Jessica Chastain, is in this. <laughs> and uh, Emily Blunt is in this. And Charlize Theron. And uh, one of those Hemsworth kids. I, I can't, keep, yeah. can't keep track of them. Um, the problem is that the movie's terrible. Mm-hmm. And it's just campy and confusing. And I just, I just had no enthusiasm. This film is just... To me, this film is totally dead on arrival. I, I, I just don't get it. Do not get the Huntsman yeah. Winter's War. Which is on 4K and Blu-ray and 3D, and they'll come and perform it live in your living room if you beg them to. Oh, really? Uh, uh, Jessica Chastain will come to my living room? Well, in a manner of speaking. Oh, at least her understudy. I love her. Okay, from Monarch, we have a movie called Kids vs. Monsters with Malcolm McDowell and Armand Asante and Lance Henriksen. Woo, yeah! Uh, the, you know what? The problem here is we already have a movie with Kids vs. Monsters, and it's called Stranger Things. And it's really awesome. Don't give it away. I don't know if there's and monsters. That you know that within like six seconds, <laughs> <laughs> it's not hard to figure out. Damn. In any case, uh, and that just makes. I mean, this is silly and campy. This is not obviously even in the same realm. I mean, this is just people real. Like Lance Hendrickson is ridiculous in this thing, and Malcolm McDowell is just so cheesing it up. Uh, it, 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 this means to be kind of fun. It means to be a little bit like the Monster Squad, the old, uh, you know. Shane Black deal, Monster Squad. Yeah. But it is. Uh, it isn't. It's It's just kind of, it's cute and silly and ridiculous and uh, very, very low budget, uh, you know, strictly for kind of genre fans. But as long as we're on the subject of Shane Black, Mark, most underrated movie of the year, my pick of the week, nice guys. You know, th- this this thing was... This a, movie, was, I don't, it's so mishandled. It was a, it was a heartbreaker because all we do is complain about how the studios never make $40 million adult fun comedies. It's, and here's one, no one saw it. It's great. This movie is great. This is so much fun. It's unbelievable. If our listeners do nothing else this week, <clears throat> if you do nothing else, <laughs> then, then, clear <clears throat> your, then clear your throat. <clears throat> Man, those, those the nuts are st- from your ice cream are still... Really? They're, they're bringing me to tears. Really? Not in a good way. Wow. The Nice Guys. If you do nothing else this week, get the Blu-ray, DVD, and ultraviolet combo with The Nice Guys and watch it and love it. It is amazing. It is wonderful. Shane Black... Had some capital after doing uh, the, uh, the Iron, the last Iron Man, and man, he just he just poured it all into this movie, which is meant to be a franchise. I don't know if they will. Nah, I don't know if we get it's, another it's, one. It's dead. It's but dead. it's so good. I want to see this. I want to see them just make more and more movies. They were, I want this they to were keep a terrific going. pair. They they, oh. they paired. He's and Ryan Gosling showed a flair for so much for that, comedy. That, that, that low comedy that I oh. thought he was terrific. Basically, it takes place in the nineteen seventies. Uh, you know, uh, a couple of guys. One's a private eye. The other guy's kind of, sort of a private eye. He's like a private beat people up eye. And uh, they ha- they reluctantly become uh, mismatched buddies in order to figure out what happened to this uh, young girl who's disappeared. And uh, there are all kinds of great misdirection in here. That you you even have an extended sequence at the mansion of a porn producer, which is just an absolutely great sequence. It is it is fun. It is funny. It is violent and profane. 
And it is just all those great things that action films were in the 1980s. And I just loved every second of this thing. Uh, cast and crew stuff on here. Uh, great uh, featurette stuff. Just a lot of fun. Really a lot of fun. you got to check out the nice guys. Shane Black at his very best. Russell Crowe, Ryan Gosling. Doesn't get better. DVD, Blu-ray, Ultraviolet. Killer film. I agree. I would see that on 4K. Yep. Maggie's Plan was directed by uh, Rebecca Miller. Now, Rebecca Miller has done a bunch of um, films before, and, I, I, and I, I, I love the fact that Rebecca Miller is making films, but I feel like each one is like watching a filmed version of, a, of an issue of The New Yorker. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's just a little too much for me, but Maggie's Plan I thought was pretty fun. It's a romantic comedy with uh, Greta Gerwig, who is in, the, in, a, she's in a weird spot now in her career. It's like, what does she do? Like, she does these little Noah Baumbach, mm-hmm. little indie things. That, does she want to do something else? Doesn't have to be Jurassic Park, but does she want to do anything else other than these films? Don't know. Anyway, she plays a, um, a young woman, and she wants a kid, and uh, she's about to go on her own to have the kid, and then she meets um, uh, Ethan Hawke, and he's a, a professor and a novelist, and uh, she falls in love. I thought this thing was – I was a little hesitant because of Rebecca Miller, who is talented, but yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not – her films don't really do it for me. But uh, I, this thing is uh, – it's, it's cute. It's got, a, it's got a screwball soul to it. It it's is. It's observational. I liked it. It is Noah Bombeckian. And I like him. I, I apologize yeah. for a lot of his stuff. Yeah. Um, it is Noah Bombeckian. It is not quite – in the Noah Baumbach vein, obviously Greta Gerwig, you know, has a lot to do with that. It's it's Woody Allen esque in some respects, but I, I it was it was I was okay with it. I like it. It's 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 got a real zigzaggy plot that yeah. that that she that she keeps straight. Um, the jokes are pretty cool, but she keep but she slows down for these interesting contemplative moments, and uh, I, I I liked it. I it's really I, I wish Woody Allen would make this film <laughs> instead yeah. of what he's been doing. I agree. Now wait a second. Give me now that movie there. Yeah, my 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 girl loves this movie. And she's really, trying to get me to see it. Yeah, and you didn't see it because nobody they like mishandled it in the release, and no one reviewed it well. And it's uh, it's a very deserving film that deserves more. Talking about genius, by the way, uh, which I will get to in a moment. But two films about geniuses. The first one is the Man Who Knew Infinity, which is on Blu-ray. Uh, which features a wonderful performance by Dev Patel, who, unfortunately, those who don't know, Dev Patel is English and does not speak with an Indian accent, but like every role that he's given in movies, he has to speak with an Indian accent. So I hope that ends soon. But that being said, uh, it's very it, what he does here is wonderful. This, this takes place on the eve of World War I, and it is the story of Srinivasa... Ramanujan, uh, who was an... If I see another movie about Srinivasa... Yeah. Srinivasa Ramanujan was a brilliant Indian (laughs) mathematician who came from nowhere and just kind of stormed into the world of mathematics uh, in England, in in upper education, uh, Trinity College in England, and just blew everyone away with his brilliance in math. But he was so theoretical that a lot of his conclusions... He couldn't actually prove how he got there. He just knew the answer to the question without necessarily knowing how to get from point A to point B. And very often it was sort of a spiritual equation for him because he was a devout Hindu as well. Amazingly, almost every conclusion, every problem that he challenged has since been validated. And uh, amazing figure, fascinating story. Jeremy Irons, of course, plays the uh, professor G.H. Hardy who mentored him and fought for him to get his due at a time when, uh, you know, being Indian was not exactly a popular thing in the, uh, in the upper intelligentsia of English higher education. But uh, written and directed by Matthew Brown, who has not done a lot before, but boy, he really deserves to because he did a bang-up job here. Really a, a terrific film, which would be a big Oscar nominee in any other year uh, because Paramount would probably spend money or some other studio would spend money. And then, of course, the other film, which is not on Blu-ray, is Genius. Uh, which I thought was a terrific movie. Nobody else did. I don't really understand what the problem was. I thought this was really well put together. Uh, This is the story of uh, the relationship between the famed um, uh, book editor Max Perkins and the great novelist Thomas Wolfe. Thomas Wolfe played by uh, Jude Law. Perkins played by uh, Colin Firth. And Nicole Kidman and uh, Laura Linney rounded out uh, very, very nicely. It is a terrific film, beautifully rendered, period. Great performances. Jude Law, people accused him of overacting a little bit as, as Wolf, of being this larger-than-life, overly flamboyant lunatic. But that's the point, because that's who Thomas Wolfe was. And uh, it just goes to show you how every genius needs an editor. And the question of the title is, who was the genius, Thomas Wolfe or Max Perkins? And it's probably both. I think the answer really is Mark Kaiser. 
Hey. So uh, with that, we are done this week. And uh, Mark, we... Uh, yeah. no. oh. So send us box boxes, emails, whatever else you want to send us. Godsdigigods.com. See you guys.